Well, friends, welcome. It certainly feels like uh, winter on a Tuesday morning, doesn't it? We're about to take down our Christmas decorations this week from the church, and that always makes me a little melancholy. <laughs> I love Christmas time. My wife does it up so beautifully in our home over the years, and we've enjoyed a, a fine Christmas season here at, at Downsview, and we're in a little bit of a restricted time here. We're trying to decide what the best move is over the next couple or three weeks, although perhaps uh, we have reasons for hope that these numbers will stabilize, but it looks like we may have to take some significant steps for a few weeks at least. But, you know, there's, there's something about that sense that we, we almost thought we were done, didn't we? And we thought we were on to the next phase. And we got through Christmas, we got through New Year's. You know, this Omicron is very transmittable or highly, easily transmittable, highly infectious, easy for other people to catch, but it's not nearly as serious. People are not getting as sick, partly the virus, it seems, and partly the effectiveness of the vaccines. And, and we're glad for that, aren't we? And we, we kind of thought we were on to the next big thing. And uh, some of these difficulties really were behind us. And we were hopeful of looking forward to what's next. And then it hit. And then a couple of days after New Year's, we thought, oh, not just this again, but what is this? Because that combination of so many people vaccinated, of the disease apparently not being as serious the ICU, num ICU numbers were quite low a while ago. The deaths were dropping like a stone. And yet, the number of infections went through the roof. The government decided they had to do something, which I appreciate. Uh, shut down the schools, shut down the restaurants, shut down the gyms, shut down the, the movie theaters. You know, all kinds of folks are encouraged to uh, stay at home if they possibly can to work. Social gatherings are limited. And... It's a little, a little hard to know how to, to take it, isn't it? And it's obviously not nearly exactly the same thing, but in light of this idea that I thought the hard times were behind me, and I was looking forward with hopefulness, and then something ugh, just so unexpected happened. I feel to some degree that's what it would have been like for Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. Because in our Bible reading through the year today, the passage is a very familiar passage in the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And after these things, that's how the author begins chapter 22. You know, Abraham has had these really ridiculous interactions with two different kings, most recently Elimelech, Abimelech, and, you know, the difficulty with his nephew Lot and all of the troubles that their family had endured in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he starts to look forward to thinking those things were behind him, surely. And it says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, and he said, here I am, Lord, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And you know this incredible heart-wrenching story if you're willing to climb into the emotions of it. And there's, there's something going on there in terms of Abraham being tested. And, and just that much of us, I want us to consider this morning, because the Bible tells us all the time that trials and difficulties are a testing of our faith. Isn't that James chapter 1, verse 2 and following? Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That, that he parallels trials and testing of your faith in James 1, 2. And surely Abraham's tremendous trial is to be understood properly as a test of his faith. Do you believe the promises I made you? Do you believe that through Isaac, your offspring, 
is going to be blessed. And yet, now he's asked to go and to kill him, to sacrifice him, to give him as a burnt offering to the Lord. And I'll, I'll bet that in that situation, a whole lot of us would have said, God doesn't keep his word. God doesn't keep his promise. God can't be relied on. God's not a God of covenantal faithfulness. He just he can't do it. He's not doing it. He can't be believed. He can't be trusted and relied upon. He's let us down. And you continue to read this familiar story of Isaac and Abraham. And James Montgomery Boyce, who was the pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia until he died from cancer, uh, must be over a decade ago now, he was speaking at one of the pastor's conferences I attended years ago. And he said, when you read through this story, that when Abraham is about to obey the Lord, we know the Lord stops his hand. But the question that Isaac asked before that, in verse 7 of Genesis 22, he says, Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide a lamb. James Montgomery Boyce suggested the entire thematic trajectory of the Old Testament scriptures from that point forward, even one could argue before that, but certainly from that point forward, is answered right there. The people of God striving to cling to the hope that there is because of the promises of God, they say, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Where, where is he? And you hear the assured voice of God, in this case through Abraham, but it's the promise of God, God will provide. Some of you surely know that Mount Moriah means the Lord will provide, and that Mount Moriah is Mount Zion, where the temple was eventually built in this picture of God's provision of his people, ultimately in the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say that, friends, because is, is it an authentic test of our faith when we're asked to believe the promises of God in spite of the kind of circumstances we see? I think that's really what a test is, isn't it? You've got to have a set of circumstances that cause you to think, if all I see is my circumstances and my experience and my perception of them, it's only bad news. Rather than, just as Abraham is in this extraordinary difficult time, and please don't let me suggest you I'm paralleling the actual, you know, closing down of the schools and the restaurants with the sacrifice of your firstborn son. I'm not paralleling that those things are the same. The parallel is that they're both trials, they're both horrendous difficulties, that as we are enduring them, they are both a test of whether or not we'll believe that God will bring us to it and therefore God will bring us through it. Sometimes even on the other side of our last breath, but God will bring us through it. And the challenge is that I've got to, I've got to cling to, or maybe even grab hold of for the first time, this test to say, do I believe God or not? My, te my test is a test of trust. It's a test of belief. Do I believe the promises of God? Now, God hasn't promised to bring us through COVID in any kind of particular way or particular season. We know that. But in a far more difficult situation as Abraham did endure, do we see the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose faith and trust in his heavenly Father was tested in that garden in Gethsemane as he sweat drops of blood? If there's any way you could take this away, if there's any way this all could turn out differently than I think it's supposed to, that way you've told me, then let it pass me by. But 
Nevertheless, your will be done. And he passed. And he was tempted and tested in all ways like us, but without sin. Without sin, meaning he did not fail to believe the promises of God. And so we look to Christ for an example and for the empowerment to believe what God tells us he's going to do even in the midst of situations that we didn't expect, don't like, and don't know how to handle, and frankly, they seem like God's letting us down. It's a great opportunity for us to guard our hearts and minds, dear friends, to believe that what we need, God himself will provide. He'll provide it when we need it, and he'll provide it on the basis of his sovereign will and his accomplishment of his promises. And our role in this is to trust him, and that may require us to pray for faith, to beg of the Lord to give us the grace to believe what he's promised us. It's the goal of the Christian life, isn't it? To exalt the promiser by believing his promises. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, friends. He's worth it, he's worthy, he's willing, and he's eager to honor his son by caring for you. Cheers.